All right, welcome to your first video lecture of the semester. And I like to call this one prehistory. Now, normally this would go up on a Monday, the first lecture of the week, but because Monday was a holiday and the semester didn't start until yesterday, you're going to get two videos for the price of one. So I'll keep this first one pretty short for you. Uh, first of all, let's talk about early ancestors. Um, most of our early history, it's speculative, meaning we're not 100% sure it's right. And it comes from a variety of different sources. There's historical sources, anthropological sources, and biological sources. So you put all three of those, history, anthropology, and biology together, and that's where we get most of our ideas from. Uh, scientifically speaking, it's pretty much accepted that our earliest ancestors appeared in the savannas of eastern and southern Africa around 4 million years. A savanna is going to be a grassland with a couple of trees. And these ancestors are going to stay in Africa for about a million and a half years. Now, why do they stay there? It's because they're limited by climate. Uh, it's not until the discovery of fire to keep them warm, keep away predators and enemies, and to allow more caloric uh, value to food that the early ancestors of us are able to move out of the savannas. Homo sapiens, they are our direct ancestors. Uh, we as modern humans are known as Homo sapiens sapiens, but these Homo sapiens, they are going to appear somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago. And they live in what's called the Paleolithic era or Paleolithic, Paleolithic age. That's also the, known as the Old Stone Age. Now these Homo sapiens are hunter-gatherers, meaning that they have to find everything that they eat. There's no growing. Uh, they're small groups, somewhere between 20 and 50 people, just big enough that they can feed everybody each day. If they get any bigger than that, then somebody's going to die or cannibalism is going to start and somebody's going to look kind of tasty. So they try to keep it down to 20 to 50 people. Uh, food gathering was a job for everyone. Uh, men hunted the animals, men hunted the big game, women gathered roots, berries, seeds, fruits, small animals. Um, it took both men and women together to feed everybody. And these kinship groups are going to be important. Uh, kinship group, it's going to be like families that are related to, together. Uh, everybody is going to contribute to their kinship group. Everybody knows their role in society. Uh, there's knowledge of plants, animals, they know what to eat, what not to eat, what to touch, what not to touch. Uh, they even know what can heal if you get sick and what can poison you. Now these kinship groups are going to be important because they establish the traditions, they establish the rules, and they establish the beliefs of these early humans. Now I have to talk just a moment about Neanderthals. And yes, it is pronounced Neanderthal, the H is silent. Uh, this was the most closely related species to Homo sapiens, and they lived in colder climates from about 120,000 years ago to about 35,000 years ago, and they were from Europe and they were from Asia. Uh, these were skilled hunters. They could speak. They could create stone tools. They had burial rituals. They honored the dead. They did art. They wore clothings, and they live on in many of us. Uh, there are estimates that about 3% of our DNA is made up of Neanderthal DNA. Uh, the only exception is if you are somebody of African descent, uh, that could be on the lower end of 1% or less. Um, now, what does that mean to us? It means that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens intermixed, ingle, intermingled, and breeded together. So we all, well, most of us have some Neanderthal DNA still inside of us. Now, what happened to Neanderthals? Um, we're still trying to figure that out. The guess is that climate change made it harder for them to live, and then Homo sapiens kind of outcompeted them, and they either died out completely or merged into the Homo sapien culture. Uh, the actual answer is still kind of out there. Agriculture. Um, agriculture is fairly new. It doesn't start until nine to 10,000 years ago. And that period is known as the Neolithic or New Stone Age. Now, the reasons for agriculture, pretty simple. Uh, there's just not enough natural food available anymore. Uh, the, the amount of wild food has declined. The domestication of plants and animals has increased. There are new ways to store your food so you don't have to hunt it and eat it all at once. And just more people means more food, and more food means more people. It becomes this vicious cycle. 
Now, the domestication of animals begins in Western Asia. Think Iraq and Iran. And sheep were probably the first animals to be domesticated. Maybe dogs, but goats and pigs are going to be right along with there. And by the time we get to about 6,000 BC, all of Western Asia, think of like the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Iran, they all have agriculture. They all have animal domestication. So what happens next? We form villages. Uh, villages are going to develop around 6,500 BC. Uh, most places have villages by 3,500 BC, and it's directly related to the birth of agriculture. Uh, you can't have a village unless you can sustain a large population, and you can't have a large population unless you have enough food. Now, villages are going to create this idea of the craftsperson or an artisan. And I always like to say when I'm in front of the class that these are going to be people that make stuff. So these are stuff makers or thing makers, if you will. Uh, they make pottery, they make weaving, uh, they make tools, they make weapons. Uh, the pots are going to allow transportation and storage of food. The weaved clothing is going to provide protection from the elements, and tools are going to make hunting and farming more efficient. Village life also means that you're going to have trade. Um, if I've got a bunch of chickens and the neighbor has a bunch of cows, I don't need to reinvent the chicken sandwich. I just give them some cows and need some chickens and everybody's happy. But it also means that there's warfare because some people out there say, why do I need to give up my chickens when I can just go take your cows by force? So the village is going to bring both trade and warfare. Now you're eventually going to have city life. Villages grow up and they become cities. Now cities are going to develop somewhere between 3500 and 3200 BC. These cities are going to have farmers, they're going to have artisans, they're going to have merchants, and they're going to have full-time administrators. And that's the first time you're going to see these full-time warriors, these full-time politicians, these full-time priests. Now generally speaking, warriors and administrators, they don't really produce anything, but they are going to protect and manage the city. And then you also have irrigation. Uh, irrigation lets the rivers be tamed. It allows for agriculture to happen because you can bring the water source to the fields. And as irrigation takes over, food production increases. And when food production increases, the population numbers explode. Now you're also going to have civilization. With civilization, you're going to get your first one around 3000 BC. It's going to happen in what would be modern day Iraq. And it's called Sumer or Sumeria. And this is going to be one of the Mesopotamia civilizations I'll talk about here in my next video. But if you want to look at a map, it's kind of where the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, and the Arabian Sea all meet. That's where the, the uh, ancient Sumeria was. And it had three classes of people. There were nobles, there were priests, then there were commoners. And then there were slaves. And each of those three classes have different rights, different laws, different duties. Uh, Sumeria traded with their neighbors. They traded for food, wood, stone, metalwork. And the Sumerians are going to develop a, a math system based on 60, uh, a writing style called cuneiform, and they're going to create one of the first organized religions. All right, that's all for this video. Um, this is going to go into the lesson one folder. And stay tuned for the second video in Lesson 2. We'll be back in a few minutes.